So this afternoon, our focus is going to be on the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 23. Lord's Day 23 has to do with the doctrine of justification. And in connection with that, I'd like to read some passages from Romans chapters 1 through to 5 and 1 through to 6 even. But what I'd like to do is actually read those passages through the sermon as I go. So instead of turning to our scripture readings, which is Romans, I'd like you to turn with me to the Heidelberg Catechism on the 23rd Lord's Day, and we'll read that together. The Lord's Day 23. And Lord's Day 23 has a title above it. It says, Our Justification. But what does it help you now that you believe all this? And when it says all this, it's referring to all that it's previously talked about, and more particularly, it's talking about the Apostles' Creed, which is just finished. So what does it help now that you believe all this? In Christ, I am righteous before God and an heir to life everlasting. And question answer 60 says, How are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ. Although my conscience accuses me that I have grievously sinned against all God's commandments, never kept any of them, and inclined to all evil, yet God, without any mercy of my own, out of mere grace, imputes to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ. He grants these to me as if I had never had nor committed any sin, and as if I myself had accomplished all the obedience which Christ has rendered for me, if only I accept this with a believing heart. The question and answer 61. Why do you say that you are righteous only by faith? Not that I am acceptable to God on account of my worthiness of my faith. For only the satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of God is my righteousness before God. I can receive this righteousness and make it my own. By faith only. So far from the Lord's Day 23. And if you do have a Bible or a device in front of you, it would be helpful if you you, uh, open it to Romans chapter 1. Otherwise, you're welcome to follow along on the screen as it's projected. So we just read together from the words of Lord's Day 23. And these words of Lord's Day 23 are perhaps the most important catechism or the most important Lord's Day in the catechism. Now, of course, it's dangerous for a minister or a student to say that they're the most important because I'm sure next week you'll hear the same thing, that the next one's also really important. But I'm hoping today as we go through this this question and answer, particularly question and answer 60, I hope you'll gain a, a renewed enthusiasm and zeal for studying this Lord's Day and Perhaps you'll understand why it indeed is one of the most central doctrines of the Christian faith. It could be claimed that question and answer 60 is is the most foundational teaching of Christianity. It's the the cardinal north, so so to speak, of the Christian religion, the center point of it. And you could even go further. It's not only the center of the Christian religion, but in, in essence, it's also the center of the Bible. It's one of the central themes of the Bible, and the central theme is this. How can I be righteous before God? That's the question that we've asked and answered in question and answer 60. How are you righteous before God? In the first two chapters of the Bible, we see man and God walking together in the garden in perfect unity and harmony together. Man dwelling with God in peace and singing God's praises, living God, loving God, and knowing God. And that's what the first two chapters in the book of the Bible are about, these two here. But the question is, what's the rest of the book of the Bible about? All the 66 books, what are they all about? Well, it's not how to become a better person. That's not the question that the catechism is trying to answer. And rather, the, the, the Word of God is trying to answer this question. How can we as sinful, evil people, how can we be accepted in the presence of a holy God. And that question, how are we right with God, is it's one of the most basic, the most fundamental questions in life and in death that we need to answer. And in fact, it's not only Christians that need to answer this question, but it's it's every living being in this world that needs to answer and wrestle with this question. How are you righteous before God? 
It's questions which every religion tries to answer in their own way. Muslims and, and Buddhists and Catholics wrestle with this question. And Christians as well, we, we all tr- seek to answer this question. How are you going to r- be righteous before God? And whether you like it or not, or whether people even ignore the truth claims of Christianity, even atheists will have to answer this question. How are you going to be righteous before God? Every person at every time in history needs to know this. And you see, a question like this is not a question which governments can fix by changing one government to another. It's not something that a vaccine can fix. It's not something that lockdowns can fix. It's, it's not even something that the United Nations seeks to address or to, to solve. And the sad reality, if we look around us, many people in the world are trying to ignore this problem. You won't find an answer to that question, how are you righteous before God? You won't find that in the public school system. You won't find it in the universities or in the government halls. But in a sense, it's that question that's become the silent killer, the pandemic amongst us all. And as we open the the Lord's Day 23 this afternoon, you will notice that it's a, a deeply personal question. It says, how are you righteous before God? How are you righteous? You sitting here in this building, you listening online, how are you righteous before God? And if you're new to us this afternoon, or if you're new to the truth claims of Christianity, there's two two fundamental elements that you need to understand before we can get into this Lord's Day. Two central truths that the Lord's Day is building off of. And the first one is this, the Lord's Day 23 recognizes that when we die, we will indeed face God, the creator of the world. So it's important that we are righteous before God because God's the creator of the world. But it's also important that we recognize that we need to be righteous before God. You see, what determines whether we receive God's favor is if we're living in a right relationship with him. And if you are, you'll be accepted by God. And if you're not, then you will be cast out from God's presence. And so the question is, are you righteous before God? And thankfully, there is an answer to that question. There is a solution to that problem. And that's the message of the Bible, the message of the the gospel, the good news of the gospel, that God saves sinners. And that's what the whole Reformation, or part of the Reformation, was based on that foundational principle. People were willing to die for that truth. That justification, we are made right by God, by grace alone, through faith alone. And that indeed is a marvel of God's grace to us. And again, that makes this question and answer fundamental for us. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ then I hope that as we go through the message this afternoon, as we go through the the particular gospel of uh, the doctrine of grace in particular, I hope that we will indeed marvel again at God's grace to us. That we as sinners, we get God's absolute best when we we deserve His worst. That gospel of grace that says that we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared to believe, and, and yet we are more loved and cherished than we ever dared to hope. It's that indeed which is the gospel of grace this afternoon. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're not living in the right relationship with Him, if you're ignoring the truth claims of Christianity, or if you're following another religion, then today this is the most important thing that you're going to hear. So don't walk out and and don't tune out of the live stream or whatever the case may be. Today the offer of life Eternal life is set before you. It's through Lord's Day 23 that we come to confess that there is indeed hope for sinners. There's grace for the wretched sinners. There's sight for those that are blind. And so I pray as we go through the message this afternoon that this will stir you and that you will come to that confession as we so often sing. Simply to the cross I cling. That naked I come to you for dress. And helpless, I look to you for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. And God's grace will be the focus of this afternoon's message. And the theme is this, God's amazing grace to a wretched sinner like me. 
And there's three aspects we want to focus on together. And that's firstly, the need for grace. Secondly, the effect of grace. And finally, the response to grace. So this afternoon, I'd like to draw the truths out of Lawyer's Day 23, and I'd like to do that through the lens of the first few chapters of the book of Romans. The book of Romans is one of those weighty, one of those dense, one of those books of the Bible that's full of lots of teachings, and sometimes it makes us scared to go into it because it's so hard to understand. But I'm hoping this morning, this afternoon, as we skip through the first four chapters, that we'll get an overall understanding of the glorious gospel of grace that, that Paul is giving to the church in Rome. Paul the Apostle was writing this letter to the new believers in Rome. He hadn't been there yet, but this was a defense of the gospel to the people in Rome. So if you have a Bible, or if you have a device in front of you, or if you can follow along the screen, we're going to turn to the book of Romans. And Romans 1 begins with some introductory comments to the churches there. He, He wants to greet the people in the name of the Lord, and he goes on to express some thanks for them for what they're doing. But then we come in verse 16 and 17 of chapter 1. We come to the overall theme, the the thesis of his book, the main point that he wants to drive to. So Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 say this. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as as it is written, The righteous shall live by faith. That's the theme of the book. What's the whole book about? Well, Paul says the book of Romans is essentially about the gospel. The gospel which is going to save men. The gospel which is going to give salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew and to the Gentile alike. And that's the point of the book. And, And the rest of the book of Romans is almost a defense of that truth claim. That God saves sinners by grace alone. And the first thing that Paul speaks about as we go through the first chapter of Romans is firstly about God. And we could read that in, verse, in the verses 18 to 21 of the first chapter. Let's read those verses together. Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God nor give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking and the foolish hearts were darkened so far. So there's something that Paul, there's some things in here that the apostle, the writer, wants us to know about who God is. And the, and the writer tells us in verse 20 that God is the creator of the world. God is the creator of the world in verse 20. And as a creator, that means God gives us, he's created us, and he gives us rules that we need to live by. We're not self-autonomous human beings. We're not self-reliant human beings. We're not self-created human beings. But rather, we are created by God for God's glory. And that's what he says in verse 21. Why did he create man? Well, verse 21 gives us at least one or two indications of that. It says there that they did not glorify him, nor did they honor him as such. You see, God expects as the creator of the world that they would indeed honor him and thank him. So all humanity is accountable to God. God expects us to love Him and to glorify Him. And this afternoon, I don't have time to to prove that from Scripture. We believe it to be the case. And if we turn to one of our confessional documents, Lord's Day 3, we can see evidence of that in the question and answer as it's asked there. Lord's Day 3, question and answer 6. It says that God is the Creator. Sorry, I'm looking at Lord's Day 6. Question and answer 6. That God created the man good and in his image. And why did he create man? Lord's Day 3 tells us. So that we might know God, love God, and live with God to praise and glorify him. 
So God created us to live with Him, to love Him, and to know Him. That's exactly what we see in the first two chapters of the Bible. We see Adam and Eve walking together in paradise with God, loving God, knowing God, glorifying God. And the Catechism encourages us and tells us in the next Lord's Day that not only do we have to love God, but we show that in how we love our neighbor. So we have to love God and love our neighbor. That's why God created us. And that means that in this life, we are always to do everything right and never do anything wrong. That's what the first few chapters tell us. And when we look at Lord's Day 23, we see a, a little reflection of that. It says in there that God expects us to have never committed any sin. And God also expects that we've accomplished all the obedience. That's what God wants from us. Never to sin and always to do what is right. And so the question that comes to us this afternoon is this. How are you going with that? How are you, how are you human being, and how am I doing with living a perfect life? So how do you stand before God? Well, that's exactly what Paul goes to the next point in, his, in chapter 1. And we can see that in verse 21. Verse 21 says this, For although they, which is the Gentiles, for although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And in verse 29, he continues with a, with a list, a description of what these foolish people are. Verse 29 says, They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. And the list continues. What a horrific list of attributes to these people. And what Paul's describing here is the irreligious people. He's focusing on they. He keeps referring about those people out there, the they he talks about. These are the irreligious, the people who have no religion. These are the people who are ignoring the truth claims of Christianity, who are dismissing Jesus Christ as their Savior. And at that time, they were called Gentiles, those that lived apart from God. And today, if we were to translate into today's world, that's all those outside around us who live as, as if God never existed. That's the millions upon millions here in Ontario, even in Burlington, who disregard the truth claims of Christianity. And perhaps it's even your neighbor or someone in your family. And Paul gives us a, a list of what these people are. He says they're futile in verse 21. Futile in their hearts. Their hearts are foolish. And that verse 29 gives us a list of what that looks like. And it's interesting as we go through that list that the list is not only so concerned with what they do, but rather wants to point out to the people that the Gentiles have a heart problem. Paul says, look at their motivations for living. It's completely wrong. And what's God's punishment for this? What's, God's holy, what's holy God's punishment for rebellious people? We see that in verse 32 of the first chapter. For although they knew God's righteous decrees, that those who practice such things deserve to die, they did not only do them, but gave approval to those who gave practice to them. They recognized, or Paul recognized here, that the punishment was death. The punishment for anyone who breaks God's law is death. Not just physical death, but eternal death. Today's language, we call that hell. Not obeying God and, and not loving God and not glorifying God as we ought to. It's a death sentence for, for us. And so there's a warning here for all those who dismiss the claims of Christianity. All those who reject the teaching of the Bible. But the author here of the book of Romans doesn't just stop with the they. In chapter 2, he, auto, he changes the pronoun to the word you. Suddenly, he turns his attention from the people out there to the people in front of him. And you need to realize the shock of what he's saying. If you want an example, it's almost as if the teacher who's in front of a kindergarten class says to the class, continue reading your book, or let's just say grade 3 because they can read. 
read your book. I just need to go out there for a moment and grab something from the room next door. And so the teacher leaves the room for a minute and you have the, re- the bunch of boys at the front corner. We all know those bunch of boys who, as soon as the teacher's out, they jump on the desk and, and they're throwing shoes at each other and doing exactly what the teacher said not to do. And perhaps in the back corner, there's a, an astute group of students who understand what the teacher said. And the first thing they do is they hold up the classroom book they're meant to read and in front of it, they put their own novel that they want to read themselves. So one group that quietly looks like they're doing the right thing and then a group over here who's noisy and, and rebellious. And as a teacher comes in, she scolds the group that are standing on the desk saying, what are you doing? You didn't listen to my instruction. And perhaps the people in the back corner are saying, yeah, look at those people. They're climbing on the desks. How silly. And then suddenly the teacher turns her attention to the back corner and says, you too. You didn't do what I asked you either. You're not reading as you should. And it's kind of that focus, that shock factor that comes into chapter 2. You see, Paul's turning his retention, attention from the irreligious people. All of a sudden, he's turning his attention to the morally good people, the good folk. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, Therefore you, he says, have no excuse, O man. You have no excuse. And in verse 9, he continues. He says, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. You see, there's trouble brewing, not just for the Gentiles out there, but also for the Jews who are inside the church. In some ways, what Peter is doing is saying, you church people in front of me, you equally have the problem as they do out there. The Jews, the morally good leaders at the time, they were equally sinners and under God's judgment. And we see an example of that in Jesus' dialogue with the rich young young ruler in Luke 18. In Luke 18, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story, one of these Jewish leaders comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? In some ways, it's the same question. What do I need to do to be righteous before God? And then Jesus lists off some of the commandments. You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. And the rich young ruler says, got that, done that perfectly, thank you very much. But what Jesus goes on to say is that you've got a heart problem, rich young man. It's not what you do that's the problem, it's also your inner motivation, your heart that's the problem. You look morally good from the outside, but inside there's a problem with you. And so the Jewish leaders at the time were equally condemned. And that truth should make us awkwardly uncomfortable. You see, how is it that these Jews who appeared to be doing everything right, who were sitting in the churches as as we might do today, and the Gentiles out there who are disregarding God, how is it that both deserve God's judgment? You see, the Jews looked pretty good on the outside, didn't they? They did everything right. Why were they getting scolded? Well, we see, we see a conclusion of all this in chapter 3. Flick over to Romans chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. We see that these words. What then? He says, are Jews any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that all, Jew, that all both Jews and Greeks, all are under sin as it is written. None are righteous. No, not one. Verse 11. No one understands. No one seeks God. They have all turned aside together. All, all people are under the power of sin, Paul says. Even the most religious person is under the power of sin. And that means you and I, we need to feel the weight of this. It's exactly what we confess in the first part of the question and answer 60 that we've read together. Although my conscience accuses me that I've grievously sinned against all God's commandments, never kept any of them, and still inclined to all evil. That's what we confess in Lord's Day 23. Lord's Day 23, the first part says, we are all sinners. You and I alike. We all deserve God's condemnation. We all deserve eternal death. We're all 100% sinners in need of God's grace. And then in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 3, we read these words. 
Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So that, it says, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. You see, from those verses, it's plainly clear that when you and I, when we draw our final breath, when we leave this world, we will stand before a holy God whom, to whom we must give an account. And Paul says that every mouth will be silenced. Every mouth will be shut. The whole world will be condemned. And that's the dark, dark picture that we confess in the first part of Lord's Day 23. We're all in desperate need of grace. We have no hope in and of ourselves. And for many today, this should be a shocking reality. And perhaps even offensive to some. Why? Because the truth of the Bible is this, that pagan people, the, the, the morally good people, the, the try as hard as you can type of people, the Buddhists and the Catholics and, and all the other religions, they're all as good as hopeless. You see, many religions in the world try to promote themselves by being devout. But Scripture tells us that's all just simply misguided. They may think they're doing much to please God, but in the end, their confidence is totally in the wrong spot. Consider the Hindus. The Hindus who say that we need to work towards spiritual perfection so that we can end this life of karma. That we need to be better, be more devout as a person. What the Catechism in Scripture tells us, that's just moralism. That's just trying harder. But we're sinful. Consider Buddhism. It's their goal to, to purify one's heart, to follow the religious principles that they set out, and through meditation and through self-discipline that eventually we can reach nirvana. That's just promoting being a religious, goodly, good person, trying harder, and yet acknowledging the source of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Consider the Islam. Follow the five religious principles. So that one day at death, based on our faithfulness, we can enter into eternal paradise, they say. It all depends on your duty, your, 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 your following of the five religious duties. And again, it's just religious. And even the Catholic Church, dare we say it, it also promotes the same idea of morality. Yes, it's true. They acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Savior. They do. But they also teach that through penance and, and through good works that somehow it, we add to that and through those we are saved. That's exactly what the Catechism is speaking against. Penance and good works don't save us at all. So do you understand the desperate need of grace this afternoon? The truth is we're more sinful and flawed than we ever dared to hope, ever dared to believe. Do you recognize that huge chasm, that huge divide between the holiness of God and the sinfulness of people, of you and I alike? And the question is, what's ever going to fill that void between the two? And the answer that the catechism gives us is not a what will fill the void, but a who will fill the void. The answer is not in a thing, but in a person. The person of Jesus Christ. And that's what the whole book of the Bible is basically about. It's about God bringing His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world so that through Him we have life. That's the message of the Gospel this afternoon, that, that God saves sinners. And we see that as we look in, in chapter 3, verses 21, starts with the word, but. And that moves us to the second point, the effect of God's grace. In chapter 3, verse 21, it starts with the word, but, but now it says. The book of Romans takes a drastic turn, as it were, a transition, but now. And I hope you love the words, the word, but. 
And if you don't, you should. I was sick, but, but now I'm healthy. I fell off the ladder, but I was safe. I was lost, but I was found. You were convicted, but you deserve eternal death, but it's that three letter word, but in Romans that gives the whole gospel of Romans hope. But now, but now the apostle goes on, there is hope. There is hope for humans to be made right with God, to be counted righteous before a holy God. 3 verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Instead of unrighteousness, we are granted righteousness. Instead of guilty, we become innocent. Instead of condemned, we can become justified. All that without the law. And then verse 22 continues. The right, sorry, I'll start at verse 21 again. Through to verse 24. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteous, righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And there are justified by His grace as gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So how are we as sinners declared righteous before God? How are we as sinners accepted and, and given eternal life by a holy God? How is it, verse 23, that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God? Well, verse 24 gives us the answer. It's only by the gift of grace that we have through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You see, we're, we are made right again. We are justified again through the work of Jesus Christ. At the very center of Christianity is the cross. For it was through the cross that Christ redeemed us. He paid the ransom. He shed His blood for us. His blood for our freedom. His death for our life. And often we call that the, the, the great exchange. Our sins were, were counted on Christ. And, and Christ's righteousness was accredited to us. What an amazing demonstration of God's love. And that's why Paul in chapter 5 breaks out with these words. But God, he says, chapter, eight, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows His love to us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And I just love this, this idea that, that Paul is writing this. The Apostle Paul. Who is Paul? Well, Paul gives us a description of who he is in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He's writing to a, a young man named Timothy, and Paul gives us a little bit of what his life was like. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 13, he says this, I was once formerly a blasphemer, he says, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, he says, but I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in an unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying, deserving of full acceptance, he says, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Did you hear that? This is the Apostle Paul, the one writing the letter, and he says, I was lost, but he found me. I was a sinner and he rescued me. I was blind and he gave me sight. That indeed is God's amazing gift of grace to us all. And that gift of grace is given to us totally free. It cost us nothing. And yes, it cost God everything. We receive life through the death of another. It's Jesus Christ who is willing to go to the cross 
the Son of Man was made to die for our, for our sins so that we might receive life. And that, my friends, is just an astounding gift of grace. Consider the true realities that we confess in this Lord's Day. I am more sinful and flawed than I ever dared to believe. And yet, I, I am more accepted and more loved than I ever dared to hope. And that, my dear friends, is the gospel message in three short words. That God saves sinners like you and like me. And what are we saved for? What does it look like now that we've been made into a, put into a right relationship with God? Well, question 59 that we read at the first part gives us a part of that. He says, I am righteous before God and an heir to life everlasting. We are given an eternal inheritance. Not only are we loved by God as if we had never sinned, but then God gives us all these blessings, including eternal life. Life forever, free of sin in the presence of Almighty God and Jesus Christ, our Savior. What a glorious future awaits. Awaits who? For who is this glorious future for? Are there some who can receive this gift of grace and others who cannot? Are there some who are more worthy for God's gift of grace and others who are less worthy? Well, as we've seen this afternoon, the gospel of grace is that God justifies the ungodly. And if God unjustifies the ungodly people, then, he unjust then He's most concertly justify you and me alike. If you're a sinner, if you don't trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're, living in a right, if you're not living in a right relationship with God, then this grace is also available to you. That's the message of the gospel of grace, that God saves sinners through the work and person of Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the third point then. And we'll close with this. The response to this gospel of grace. As I said previously, question and answer 60 is a deeply personal question. How are you righteous before God? How do you get this righteousness for yourself? Well, we already saw an answer to that in chapter 3, verse 22. In, verse, in chapter 3, verse 22, it said this, that it's through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Believe in Jesus Christ, Paul says. And in fact, if we turn back to the first chapter, to that theme verse of chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, we see that same call. Paul says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what should our response to be to the gospel of grace this afternoon? That God saves sinners. Well, it's the call to believe. And that's exactly where question and answer 60 closes. After giving the definition of how we are saved by faith, the catechism calls us to believe. It closes with these last two lines. If only I accept this gift with a believing heart. So the call is to believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Savior of the world. Believe the promises that are true and true for you. So the question that you need to be asked this afternoon is this. Do you believe this message of grace that God saves sinners? Have, have, you, have you sought your refuge in the rock of ages? Have you totally surrendered yourself? And instead simply cling to that bloodied cross. Do you believe that the, that the Lord, the Lord has promised good to you? Is this your greatest treasure? Your confession that Jesus sought you in a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He 
to rescue you from danger, bought you with his precious blood. Is that your confession this afternoon? Dear friends, if Jesus Christ is not your Savior this afternoon, if you don't yet believe in the truth claims of Christianity, if you're struggling with understanding the contents of this message here, this amazing truth of the gospel of grace, then this message is also for you. God saves sinners. He can abundantly pardon all your sins. Jesus Christ came into the world for people like you and me. Forgiveness is for the guilty. And the message comes to you this morning, as you are broken and in need of grace, to turn to Him, turn to your Savior, Jesus Christ, who is great in mercy. Do not rise from your seat till you have wrestled and considered this matter well. Is this not the most wonderful and important message of the gospel of salvation? And for those of us who do believe, for those of us who do by faith accept Jesus Christ and all His benefits, then I hope that as we leave from here this afternoon, we again cherish this Lord's Day, which demonstrates the amazing grace of God. I hope that through this you become more convicted that this is such an important Lord's Day. You are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared to believe. And at the same time, you are more accepted and loved than you ever hoped for. As one person said, You've been saved from the worst thing that could ever happen to you. And you've been saved for the best thing that could ever happen to you. Life everlasting in the presence of Jesus Christ. Indeed, by grace you were redeemed. By grace you were set free. And now we can freely walk into the arms of Christ our Lord. Let me close with these, this doxology from Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11, where Paul breaks out into, into praise for God. Verses 33. Oh, he says, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom of knowledge of God. How, understand, who, how unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable are his ways. Verse 36. For from him and through him. And to Him are all things forever and ever. To Him be the glory. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly God, we thank You that we thank You for the rich message of grace that we could hear this afternoon. We thank you for your love towards us. How vast it is beyond all measure, Father, that you should give your son to make a wretch his treasure. Father, we see in this Lord's Day again this afternoon, we're reminded of the pain of searing loss as Jesus Christ hung on the cross for our sins. It's only through your son, Jesus Christ, and and His death on the cross that many sons are brought to glory. Lord, as we confess in this Lord's Day, in, even in this Lord's Day this afternoon, it wasn't in some way that our voices that held Him on the cross, it was our mocking voices that called out. It was our sin that held Him there. And yet, Lord, the marvel of all marvels is that through His death, we receive life. And Lord, for that reason, we have nothing to boast. No gifts and no power. No wisdom at all do we boast in, except we boast in the person of Jesus Christ. It's through His death and resurrection that we have life. That we experience Your grace towards us. And so, Lord, we thank You for this message of grace this afternoon. That You save sinners. We pray as we consider this even in the week to come that we may marvel at this glorious gospel and that we may live a life of thankfulness for what you've given towards us. Lord, I hope it also drives us again into the community as we reach those around us and that we seek to, to warn and, and speak to those who are living a life apart from Jesus Christ 
Lord, it's only through a recognition of Jesus Christ as Savior that there's life. We pray this may empower us as we go into the community again in this week ahead. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to sing praises collectively. We've missed it for so long, and it's beautiful to be able to do that. And so, Lord, as we go into the community again, we pray that you encourage us. Encourage us as we continue to study your word personally and together as Bible study groups or small groups or whatever the case is. We pray that we may be people of your word as we could hear this morning that our feathers turn from gray to pink as we continuously invest in your word. Would we pray that we may be people of your word and that through it we may live lives of grace. Father, we pray will you be with us now and hear us for our prayers and be with us for the remainder of this day. We pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen.